Welcome everyone. My name is Adam Savitt. I'm Director of Communications at the Center for Security Policy. Welcome to our uh, next event in our webinar series. Uh, today's program is entitled Israeli-Iranian Relations After the Mullahs, uh, featuring David Wormser and Dr. Harold Rove. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, you are in listen-only mode. However, you can ask questions uh, via text in your GoToWebinar control panel, and I will reappear to ask those questions to the panelists uh, after the main program. This uh, event will be recorded. It will be on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash securefreedom. You can also access it on our website at securefreedom.org. And with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, director of the Center's Project on Global Anti-Semitism and the U.S.-Israel Relationship, David Wormser. Hi, welcome everybody, and I'm glad you could join us. Uh, today, we're gonna pick up a new topic that uh, isn't dealt with all that often in Washington. Everybody talks about Iran, but nobody talks about Iran after the Ayatollahs. Uh, this regime is uh, certainly in trouble on some level. It is certainly divorced in some way from its own people. So it's worth considering exactly what might be in Iran afterwards, and specifically what, what major strategic uh, conditions could arise between Israel and Iran and, and Iran elsewhere. Uh, again, I don't know when the Iranian regime will fall. It could be tonight, it could be in a week, it could be in a year, it could be in five years. It's impossible to know these things. Uh, but, but the post-Islamic -revolution, post revolution era is already beginning to show some signs of coming to life, already seeing some things inside Iran that we could, we could examine. And from that, we can extrapolate some things that might be afterwards and, and, and see whether this is a, a circumstance which, which some people seem to dread uh, as, if, as if the Iranian regime is better than what could follow. But in our case, I think, I think there's also hopeful things, and, uh, but tempered things. So, with that, let me get started here. Uh, my friend, uh, first I, I will go, and then and then my good friend Harold Road will go. I'll introduce him when I'm done. Um, uh, but let me start with the framework that I approach this from, which is I do see uh, old patterns of existence, old civilizations, and cultural structures as the foundations for how nations behave over the long run. There may be aberrations in the short run, but in the long run, they fall back to form. And in Iran's case, I think we're seeing the falling back to form to in fact be a form of resistance against the regime. This uh, nostalgia that you're beginning to see emerge among Persians, among Iranians. Uh, I say Persians, it really should be Iranians because as, as, as Harold will, go, will describe to us, uh, there are some Azeris and others who, who we shouldn't write off as Persians even. Uh, but at any rate, the bottom line is, there is a certain language through which opposition is taking shape, part of which does tap into at least a thousand year old history of Iran, perhaps a much older history of Iran. Um, and I can give you a few examples to this. Uh, first of all, even the a person that uh, we look at as one of the most horrific leaders of Iran in the last two, three decades, Ahmadinejad, uh, when it was very interesting that toward the end, when he started running into political trouble, he choreographed a series of events where it looked as if it didn't, it was actually virtual, but but he made it look as if he was walking with Putin down the Avenue of King in Persopolis. This was a very clear message that he is returning to the role of Persia, ancient Persia, and here he sort of cropped it as if Putin was paying homage to the King of Persia. It was a very interesting thing for somebody who, uh, who was part of the Islamic Revolution. But again, it was when he was in political trouble and he started reverting much more strongly to populism. The second thing is in Iran today, we see very strong uh, study, reference, and uh, uh, use of Ferdowsi, a, a, a poet, an author from a thousand, over a thousand years ago. The interesting thing about 
about Ferdowsi, he wrote uh, one of his his seminal work was was Shaname. And in that, he talks about leadership and, and good and bad leadership, evil leadership, and so forth. That in itself is significant. But even more significant is who he was and what he represents. He was apparently Islamic. We, we think he was. He lived in a period in which it was. But he was also a member of a group of people, uh, a structure in society that has historically also been identified as those who were resisting the Islamification of Iran and were, and, and were essentially trying to restore the pre-Islamic invasion Iranian character, hence his focus on the use of language and really inventing what we have as the modern Persian language. What's very interesting is the explosion of study groups of Ferdowsi, references to Ferdowsi, veiled attacks on the government citing Ferdowsi, uh, and uh, in, indeed, uh, various murals and others illustrating Shaname of Ferdowsi, even though the government keeps having to paint them over. So Ferdowsi, in a sense, has become a symbol of opposition, which means, again, that returning back to Persian, at least one aspect of Iranian character, the, the Persian uh, character, is becoming a mechanism to resist the government. Second point that I would make is the use of uh, the tombs in Iran, uh, some of which date back to the Persian times, some of which were even of Queen Esther, which is an interesting uh, circumstance. So I, I, I would focus a lot on the fact that you're seeing old Persian cultural characteristics playing a role. Again, Her uh, Harold will go a little bit more into how much of a role, but they do play a role. Now, what could we derive from that to have an impact strategically in the long run? Well, first of all, the uh, Persian character, the ancient Persian culture, is not absolutely distinct from the Indian culture, uh, the larger uh, Indo-European bloc in the center of that area of the, of the whole Indus Valley and the expanse of the Indus Valley that reaches into Iran and into India. So one could imagine, and if one travels to India and talks with Indians about Iran, one does get a sense that there's a, a connection that is not normal. It is, it is not the same way, say, I am connected to Zimbabwe. It, it just doesn't have, there, there is some tie, some romantic, emotional tie. Um, the second thing is that the elites of India are often Zoroastrian businessmen, and still, and and they're basically Persian immigrants, uh, Iranian immigrants. So there's there's all these connections. So that's a very interesting sort of foundation to look at. But what about the other direction? I mean, we always look at Israel and Iran as the definition of enmity, of of hatred, and and with this regime in Iran, it, it really is uh, the image of 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 the saloon in the West when the, when the sheriff walks in and says, this, this town ain't big enough for the two of us. And, and, and truly with the Iranian regime in Israel, it, it really is that. There is, a, there is an absolute uh, 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 twilight struggle, one or the other will win. Uh, and my belief is of course that the Israelis will win and the Iranian regime will not. Um, so, but then where, what sort of things can we look at if culture ancient culture uh, emerges again, what patterns in the past can we see that might have some impact on, on, on relations today and could be somewhat of a guide? So the first thing I'd, I want to turn to is the, the easy one, how Jews look at Persians. Well, clearly Iran right now is, uh, is uh, a great enemy of Israel and, and the Israelis look at it as a mortal threat. But Let's go back to the first contacts between Israel and Persia. It's when the Jews were in exile after the Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem in 586 BC. They themselves were ousted very quickly. That dynasty that did it was ousted very quickly by the dynasty that led to Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and Cyrus, and so forth. So um, suddenly there was this large uh, exile community of Jews in Persia. 
in, in a Persian government that had thrown out the people who made the Jews exiled in Persia. And one of the first acts he did was to uh, issue a decree. And if you go to London, you can see the cylinder that still has the decree on it. I mean, it's it's a it's a not a tablet, a cylinder. And in, on that cylinder is written the words of of restoration of the temples and so forth. Now, of course, we see a much more detailed, uh, much more complex recounting of this in the Bible itself. And I would note two things. One is uh, the large, long, uh, and quite detailed involvement of Persia's role in re rebuilding Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. They didn't just let the Jews return. They released funds from the coffers of the Persian Empire to help the Jews rebuild their temple and re help the Jews return to, to, to the land of Israel. So um, I would note there, it was so important, there are actually two places in the Bible which recount this whole thing. One is at the beginning of Ezra, and the second one is the last paragraph. The last paragraph in the Bible, in the Jewish Bible, what leaves you, this is you know the last paragraph of any work, is what leaves you with a, with reflection and thought. And uh, let me just read very quickly what it says, the last, last lines. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. The writing, of course, is the cylinder that we have in the British Museum. And this is what Cyrus, King of Persia says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. So these are the final thoughts the Bible leaves us with. This is not enmity. This is not hatred. Indeed, I think what happened following this and why Cyrus did this is one, one has to understand this history recounted in the Bible as uh, one has to look at it through the prism of geopolitics. There were lots of very, and, and this is the, the bane of Israel on some level, it's a, such a strategic crossroads that it always has become the playground for great powers. Well, Persia was one of those great powers and it saw the return of the Jews to some extent as a vassal state or as allies who could help uh, block the emergence of other uh, uh, inimical powers. Um, throughout history from roughly the restoration of the, sec of the first temple, well, the, when the second temple was destroyed, the restoration by building the first temple, uh, which was, again, we saw the reference to it right now, um, this continued throughout the next six, seven, eight hundred years. Uh, there were gaps when the land of Israel was occupied by the Greeks and by the Romans. But very interesting when the Romans, uh, they would seek the region, seek through the region for allies, minions, uh, vassal states to help do their strategic bidding. And one group of them were a group of Arabs that, to, that one would identify in southern Jordan and in um, northern Saudi Arabia today, they were called the Hassanid Arabs. Um, so these Arabs uh, were vassals of the Roman Empire. The Jews, the Romans did not trust. Uh, and they knew that there was still a tremendously powerful, large and influential exile Jewish community that remained in Babylonia and Persia. Uh, number one and number two, they knew that the Jews had traditionally been also strategically aligned with Iran. So in many ways, the Jews were seen to be a bit of a fifth column. It's very interesting is this could probably be even an influence on the early Islamic history because the rise of Muhammad, Muhammad's family name is Al-Harith. Al-Harith is the Arabification of the uh, uh, Roman word Arethas, which is, uh, or Greek uh, Arethas, which was the king of these Hassanid Arabs. So he comes from the, the Harith family from which ultimately uh, Muhammad comes, or who we think is Muhammad comes, is connected in name to the royal family 
of the Hasanids. So one would imagine what the Jews would mean to him. These would be allies of Persia. And he comes from a tradition that was allied with the Romans. So right off the bat, you can see these tensions. But I, I, I highlight this because the foundations of Jewish-Persian relations is very complex, but there are bases for building a strategic partnership. Now let's go forward. This is ancient history. Well, I think it's important. Many would want to have something more current to, to hold on to. I would go to the formation of the State of Israel and the former of the State of Israel in the beginning, David Ben-Gurion, the, the first prime minister. Uh, one of the things that Ben-Gurion did in the early 50s, very, very important, was he was terribly worried about the soul of the Jewish people. He saw, he saw the Jewish people as awfully distorted by the, by the Holocaust, but even more by the 2,000 years of exile. So, and, and he looked how de Gaulle and Europe struggled to rebuild French identity after the occupation of the of the Nazis and so forth. So he saw that there was a real need to rebuild, restore some sense of Jewish national identity, even beyond simply relying on the Bible to provide that for us. After all, he was a socialist, so the Bible does in his mind have an impact, but it's not something you depend on entirely. So where does he turn? He ironically turns to Persia and he, works and actually suggests to the Shah of Persia the rebuilding of per ancient Persian culture. Now this had a strategic meaning, but more also importantly, he saw the use of Persia as a template that can reflect back on Israel to help create Jewish and Israeli identity. And uh, so, so in some of his interactions with the Shah of Persia, some of the ideas that you see today, the rebuilding of certain um, uh, uh, ma mausoleums and, uh, and archaeology and so forth, some of the things that the Iranian people right now are referring to and hooking onto as a language of opposition was actually, to some extent, originally the product of discussions or contacts or, or interactions between the Shah of Persia and, and Ben-Gurion. So again, I think, I think there's a very strong uh, foundation that can be built on. It's again, uh, as Harold will get into, uh, it is not something that we can simply say, oh, well, that's it. It's going to be great. They're going to be friends, strategic allies. This is like Britain and the United States. No, it's not. But it's, it's something to, to keep in mind, reflect on, build on, and eventually it could be one of the pillars defining that relationship. So um, I've gone on long enough for the moment. Let me turn this over to Harold Road. Let, let me introduce you first to Harold. Um, you, can, you can look up online who Harold is, and it will tell you that he was all sorts of very senior positions in the Pentagon, advisor to the Secretary of Defense, uh, to, to the uh, Office of Net Assessment. He was in the Office of Net Assessment for a long time. Uh, and so forth. He's retired right now. But those of us who really know Harold know the real biography of Harold. The real biography of Harold is that there's nobody on the face of the earth who represents the spirit and depth of knowledge that the great Middle East scholar that we all live in the shadow of, Bernard Lewis, uh, represents. And, and Harold truly is his protege. Uh, the second thing is Harold is what is the glue that holds intellectual networks in Washington together. And all of us, Washington would be an impoverished place. I, I, people don't understand how Washington works often. Well, it's the, it's, it's the building of ideas and political fighting, but Washington is also about political communities, almost tribes in some way. Well, Harold is the tribal leader. He's the one who, puts, who put a whole group together. So he plays a very important role in that way. And then finally, Harold has an unchained mind, untethered mind. Uh, so Harold thinks crazy thoughts all the time, which turn out to be the most forward-leaning and most perceptive insights that eventually the rest of us realize was quite true and quite accurate. And so he's the generator of ideas. The initial um, 
the initial draft of ideas often. So without much further ado, and in that informal introduction to Harold, I turn it over to my friend. Dave, thank you. And I could only hope that I live up to what you just said. Uh, uh, I know, I would say, as uh, our late uh, mentor Bernard Lewis said, I know how little I know. I'm 70 years old. I've been working on uh, the Middle East since I'm about 14. So it's a long time, a lot of experience and a lot of conversations. And what I would like to do in the next few minutes is take off, really, just add maybe a few things to what Dave said. And I want then to talk about the about Shiism, Sunnism, where Iran fits in, the Iranian relationship with Islam, because it's very much a love-hate relationship. It's not, today, I, there are many young people who will say, I hate Islam. Yet, as they say that, they're intellectual way of thinking is so influenced by it. So anyway, when does this battle between Persia and uh, Persia is Iran, we could use either really, it's the same word, one word for two countries, let's say, or, or, or civilization. But when does this battle start? It starts in the sort of around the 640s, 650s, uh, when the Muslims coming out of Arabia, uh, uh, they conquer and defeat the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire by that time was already 1,100 years old. That's 1,400 years ago. Who are these desert nomads, as the Arabs, as the Persians would refer to the, the Arabs? They called them lizard eaters, rodent eaters, and a lot worse. Who are they to come out and, and destroy us, one of the most highly civilized uh, civilizations on the world, ever in the world? And it, it killed them. Now, for the next 300 years, we don't know much about Iranian history because they were totally subsumed by the Arabs. And they become Muslims, whatever that means, and we're not exactly sure. But there was. 300 years later is the reemergence of Persian culture. Now we write in Arabic, Arabic letters. We uh, upwards of 70% of the Persian language over the years became Arabic words. Now Dave mentioned Fardusi, the writer of Shahnameh, which is the Book of Kings, which was written again as Dave said over about a thousand years ago. What was the goal of this? It was, uh, we will help you Arabs. We're Muslims like you, but we will help you run this, uh, this empire that you have created because you are inferior and don't know how, and we have this historical tradition. Now, what was interesting about the Book of Kings, the Shahnameh that Fardosi wrote, is that it has 50,000 quatrains. It's poetry. And by that time, Arabic has, had penetrated the Persian language to such an extent that it was almost impossible to, uh, to write anything uh, without Arabic words. And the great feat that Fardosi did in writing his Book of the Kings is that in all these lines, there are so few Arabic words, it is unbelievable. The goal was basically to tell the arabs you're nothing we're the ones that matter and you formerly on the outside we're muslims were um we're, we're sunnis even sunni back then but we are not uh but we're the ones who know what to do you know why this it shows the strength of persian culture why this is important is when the um arabs came out of arabia and conquered all of what is the Arab world today, within a hundred years, the language really, which was Aramaic before, really they had Arabicized and Islamicized most of the area. The classic cultures were gone, but not Iran. Iran stops this Arab, the Arab, the the Arab, Arab, Arabizing, shall we say, the um uh uh. uh, uh the, the whole Islamic world. Now, what does this mean and why is it important today? Iran did its best to, to 
capture, to, to, to maintain its separateness. Iranians say one of the most favorite foods of Iranians is onions. I lived in Iran at the time of the revolution, was going to university, and I remember bread and onions was a big thing for simple people. Now, what is so special about the onion? There's a core, and it's surrounded by layer and layer and layer, and an onion protecting that core. That is Iran. The central culture of Iran is the core, and all we will adopt this, we'll adopt that, we'll adopt, we adopt it as long, but it's not part of the core. Now, what happened was, when I said they were, were Sunnis, until about the 1500s, which really becomes key for what happened then for today, is that all of the rulers of the Muslim world basically were of some form of Turkish or Turkic origin. Turks are originally from Central Asia, they're not from Anatolia where they are today. And all of them were not only Sunnis, they were what are called Hanafis. Uh, they, they're one of the four legal schools of Islam. So what does this great Turkic leader in Iran in around the year 1501, Shah Ismail, he decides to form, everybody is the same. How do we protect Iran? We form another layer of the onion. We adopt Shiism. Now to us, Shiism is uh, its a form of Islam, but the hatred that they have had historically is unbelievable. It's sort of like the, let's say in Northern Ireland, the Protestants and the Catholics in, in the worst days. And in the Middle East, for better or for worse, and from a Western point of view, it's for worse, uh, problems are never solved. They're always pushed under the rug because there is no way to solve problems Permanently. I'll wait for the opportunity and I will get you. Now, the entire rest of the Middle East is basically run by Sunnis. In today's population terms, about 86% of the Muslim world is Sunni, let's say maybe 1.2 billion, and then another two or 300 million are Shiites. We all, that is anybody who lives in the Middle East, um, swim in a Sunni sea. So Shiism, a, and in this case, Israel, have the same problem. Everybody is surrounded with and have to deal with the Sunnis. Now, things like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, these are all Sunni organizations. And this is where Israel and Iran, which is Shiite today, um, have something in common, and it is, shall we say, a strategic relationship uh, that no matter who rules Iran, unless it's a bunch of crazies like are ruling it today, the people of Iran, as they've said from the time of the Bible to today, have had a unique relationship, which is that they, in the um, in Iran, the people of Iran. And the people in Israel, the Jews there, have a common enemy. That is the people between them. And, uh, and, and therefore, what you have now is an aberration. That is the people ruling Iran. Now, um, there are non, like, within the Shiites, there's a lot of hatred between each other, as there are between Arabs. It's not, they're not all united. And again, why this becomes important is there are Arab Shiites. For example, southern Iraq is basically Arab Shiite. Iraq itself, uh, it's, a, it's a fake country. It's only 100 years old. There's nothing in common that most have to feel with each other. Um, there are Arabs there. Now, the Persians, as I said, look down on Arabs, including the Shiite Arabs, as their lizard eaters and all that other stuff, whatever that I mentioned before. But the Arabs look at the Persians and I'm going to see, see if I can translate this proverb in a way that we don't get uh, put off the air here. Um, when you break, the Arabs say, when you break open the burn of a Persian, let's say S, H, whatever, T comes out. That shows how much the even the Arab Shiites think of the Persians. So there's a lot of internal hatreds. Now, um, 
what do the Shiites think of the Jews? And this becomes important. Now, before Israel existed, when the Jews had no power anywhere, a huge number of Jews over history in Iran were forced to convert to Shiism from Judaism. A life was impossible. And there's no doubt that life for Jews under Sunnis was better than under Shiites. But then Jews had no power. Today, they have power. They have Israel. And uh, Iran is Shiite. What do they both share in common? This, they, they, the, that the Sunnis want to destroy them. Uh, now, uh, so it sounds like there's something in common. How do, let me give you some proof of this. Southern Lebanon is filled with Shiites. They're Arab Shiites by and large. Now, when the Israelis moved into southern Lebanon in uh, 70, I think it was 78 or so, something like that, or then also in 82, 83, the way the, the Shiites greeted the Israelis was as liberators. How do we know? The Shiites lined the streets, are clapping, are throwing flowers at the Israeli tanks and whatever forces are moving in and throwing rice at them, all of which are signs is thank you, thank you. Thank you for what? For liberating us from the yoke of the Palestinian Sunnis, because Palestinians are all Sunni. There are a few Christians that are still left there, but it's it, overwhelmingly Sunni. And these people were oppressing the Shiites. So you see here a natural bond between the two, these two oppressed peoples, the Jews, and the Shiites. Now, with all the the amazing things that are going on within Iran today, a lot of our people are um, saying, "Oh my God, there's so many ethnicities in Iran that the fourth people who oppose the government, um, we we should uh, play the ethnic card in Iran." Now. Um, it sounds very good, I guess, to the Western ear, but it is extremely dangerous, and here is why. The best theoreticians of Iranian nationalism are what are called the Azerbaijani Turks. The Azerbaijani Turks live in northwestern Iran, by and large, and there's a cone which goes to Tehran. Now, I can tell you, the first time I was in Iran, 1977, I spoke a, a good Turkish, but I, I knew Persian grammar, but I didn't speak Persian very well. And what I found in Tehran is that I could use an Azeri Turkish and Turkey Turkish are basically dialects. I want to say um, they're closer than Southern English, so Southern American, excuse me, let's say the, the Southeastern American um, English. And North and shall we say the Northeast Coast? They're mutually intelligible. There are a few phrases here and that you learn, you pronounce it, but it's the same. Now, how is it then? The Persians very clearly is Persian nationalism that they've described here. How is it that the Azeris uh, are? I want to say they see themselves as more Persian than the Persians. And it's a very interesting story. I mean, this sounds sort of the oppressor, the oppressed, that is the Azeris, are saying, we're, we're the real Persians. How are they the real Persians? It's that they are descendants of the Medes and the uh, uh, Archons. I, I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember the name. It's, it's escaped to me. These are the people who were true ancient Iranians. And rumor has it among them, and they have a lot of stories. The land was conquered in about 1401 by Timur Lin, um, who was a Central Asian Turkish speaker, and he hated Persians. And he cut out, this is according to the rumor, 400,000 tons of Persian speakers in what is Azerbaijan today, that is Iranian Azerbaijan. And that's how they were forced to speak Turkish. But the real language is Persian. Now, this is, that's how they think. So, the fact is that if you add, it, I, I tend to think that the Azeris, the Azerbaijanis in Iran are probably slightly larger than the number of Persians. And this is spending a lot of time in Iran and in the learning of this country. 
over the years. There is no way you're going to be able to divide Iranian Azerbaijan, uh, Iranian as they would say, Azeri, for, um, and, and Persians. Because together, and there may be 75%, maybe even more uh, of, of the country. So playing the Azeri card, which all sorts of people have talked about here in Washington, is uh, can only backfire. The Israelis understand this very beautifully. There are some people who, who even there, who believe that it's a good idea to try to um, play the ethnic card. And here's even the proof. When the Soviet Union broke up, now about one fourth of the Azeris today live in Az what was former, formerly Soviet Azerbaijan. These people came to America, and they were the scholars. They were talking, and they were. A lot of them talk to me again. I can speak with them. I don't speak Russian, but I speak Turkish. And they had a real problem. And that is that they were sure that once they were free, that the Iranian Azeris would want to join them as an independent state, not part of Iran. And they were sad. And they said, why is it that the Iranian Azeris say, we're Azeris, but we're Iranian Azeris. We're Iranian. In other words, Iran, Persia is what matters more than anything. So I wouldn't play this card that a lot of people uh, talk about that they want to uh, uh, do. Um, and I would also say, from our point of view, it would be a very good idea not to be involved, either the United States or Israel. And I think Israel is better at knowing uh, uh, politics inside of Iran than America, from simply my experience. Don't. Uh, try to support one group versus another because Iranians culturally can very easily tell you everything that you want to hear. I can give you from personal experience. Um, a senior Ayatollah, not a grand Ayatollah, from somewhere in Iran uh, uh, about uh, 18, 19 years ago uh, uh, was in Paris talking with some Israelis. And um, a friend of mine called me who was part of this Israeli group and say, he said, Harold, can you come here? It'll be interesting for you to see what's going on. Now, here was the senior person in the Iranian establishment talking with the Israelis. What was the purpose? In Iran, the leadership, this is a story of, about a friend of mine, and he, uh, he is from Guam, which is the holy city, and uh, one day his father called the five or six sons together and said, we have to have a family meeting to protect our future. Now this is in the, um, this was in the late seventies. What do we do? He said, I, and he was a senior religious figure, this man. He said, I want my oldest son, I want you to go into the religious establishment. The next son, he says, I want you to be part of the Tulte. Tulte is the communist party of Iran. The next was part of Rastakhiz, which is was the Shah's white revolution party in the in the parliament. Another was involved in ethnic politics. I don't remember the rest. But from an American point of view, why is it that one family has so many people in different camps? Um, it's sort of odd. But these are not people in different camps because they believe in them. Whatever happens and whoever rules Iran, the family is protected. The wealth of the family is protected. Nothing is going to happen because in the winner's camp, there'll be somebody that the family can rely on. And family is the basis of everything in Iran. So I would argue that if someone comes and says, ah, they support America, they support whatever, um, they're just looking by and large for our uh, support that we should um uh, either us or the Israelis, and the truth is Iranians don't really see much of a difference between the two. Even the ones who are Persian nationalists or Iranian nationalists, and let's say they can even tell you they hate Islam, fact of the matter is that they um, maintain a lot of the, uh, shall we say, uh, prejudices of Islam towards non-Muslims that, you know, we non-Muslims should uh, you know, know our place. We, we do not have a right to rule in that part of the world. I mean, we are in political and social inferiority. We should know our place. And so to me, getting involved with any group in particular is dangerous because they can turn on you. And I watched this 
in demonstrations when I was going to university it was actually called Farabosa University that you know that they brought up in the beginning in Mashhad in northeastern Iran that when there were demonstrations people were yelling we don't want shock and then all of a sudden the police came in and started to beat up a few heads and they the change the change changed we don't want another sure why we have one already in other words finger in the air they can they they'll go back and forth in an instant they can change sides so i would shall we say counsel in this case the israelis what you want to do is bring the regime down you want to make sure that it does not have the nuclear these people in power we're not opposed to iran having nuclear weapons if they were a normal country like the united states and they want to get away know, are we afraid that england or france or or, or even India have nuclear weapons. If, if you have a democracy where the government has to answer to the people, you're not going to be using weapons like nuclear weapons for the fun of it. But the Iranians, the, the present government in Iran is quite capable of doing this. Now, I realize I'm talking all over the place. I would only say that the Israel's natural ally within Islam should be the Shiites. But the establishment in Iran, the religious establishment has gone overboard to try to undermine the Sunnis and Israel is the pawn that they use. Why? The Shiites don't care a thing about Israel. It means nothing. Nothing whatsoever in Jerusalem means nothing. It's a, Shi a Sunni invention and anything that the Sunnis invented is forbidden in Shiite Islam. But the Iranians are basically trying to say, we will take care of the Israelis, we will uh, have a nuclear bomb we'll, and we'll use it. And then you'll see which form of religion is right and everybody will convert. We want, you know, as a result, we've proven right. God is clearly, Allah is on our side. And since we eliminated Israel, we're right. And you, you Sunnis um, should, should change sides. You should become Shiites like us. And now this sounds to us absolutely absurd. But in the Middle East, what I've just said makes total sense. I've talked too much. Oh, Harold, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, we'll turn to questions in one second. I just uh, wanted to note one thing, too. Uh, Harold, when you're saying about playing the minorities, it's also remember the, the currency of legitimacy in the Middle East is protection. Uh, a leader must protect his people because the primary concern in the Middle East beyond anything is the quest for survival in a, in a very anarchistic world. Um, if the United States tries to play the uh, uh, fissures within Iran of that sort, uh, it, it will touch immediately on the existential, the, uh, the feeling or the threat, threat to survival that these communities face. And the Iranian regime will instantly seize on that. It will say, you see, you're trying to turn us into Assyria. You're trying to turn us into hell. Um, so it really, our opposition has to be cast either in some lofty terms in our values like, like freedom, or also very importantly in terms of the Iranian regime as a barrier to the realization of the greatness of Iran. In other words, that your regime is humiliating you. It is weakening you. It is causing you not to fulfill the historical destiny and the protection and safety that you truly deserve. So you tap into that nationalism and turn it on the regime. That's that's really how you can't do that if you're trying to divide and split up the Iranians. So uh, with that, um, Adam, if if we have questions, I think I think we should uh, we should leave it to. Uh, some of the listeners to to have a shot at getting their uh, their concerns and their uh, interests expressed. Absolutely. Uh, thus far, there's no specific. It's not addressed to anyone specific. So uh, whichever of you would like to take it. Um, how might an Islamizing Turkey fit into the future Israeli-Iran relationship, perhaps in an opportunistic way or as a spoiler? Uh, you know, my my feeling is uh, again. I, I I'm a, I'm I, I I think the use of analogies is horrible, uh, uh, but I'm going to use one. Uh, I think you need to look at the end of World War II, the last months of the war, to really understand 
that what, what is going on here. We knew in May, April, uh, or even earlier, February, and so forth, that the Soviet Union, uh, 1944, 45, was going to be our enemy, and that it was going to be a big problem. Uh, but we had, to, we had to get over the first problem first, because we knew we were going to have to somehow end this war totally and bring the Germans to our side against the Soviets, the Soviet Russians. To do that, we had to utterly eliminate uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Nazi government. We couldn't work with the Nazis. So the strategic uh, imperative of finishing off the Nazis transcended the threat they posed to us and became a barrier to strategically preparing ourselves to, uh, to address the emerging threat of the Soviet Union. So we had to destroy the Nazis entirely, eliminate them from the face of the earth. This is where we are with the Iranians and the Turks. I think everybody in the region, Israel included, understands the emerging threat of Turkey. It is a very grave threat. It is a very serious threat. It reaches across the Middle East. Uh, it it right, reaches deep into Europe. The Turks have fingers all over every capital in Europe, through exile communities, through Muslim Brotherhood communities, and so forth. The bottom line is everybody in the region is beginning to organize around the threat of Turkey, but nobody can move on yet beyond the threat of Iran because that's still the active, acute, and very serious threat. So we're in that position where the imperative of eliminating the Ayatollah regime, moving beyond the Ayatollah's regime in Iran, is, is now the, uh, it, it, not doing so is the barrier to strategically preparing ourselves where the region is going. Um, so it, it, it isn't anymore just, I'm not belittling the threat Iran poses to Israel. This is, this is a very grave threat. And hopefully, and perhaps in the last few weeks with all these, these horrible accidents, the, the Israelis are dealing with this problem or somebody's dealing with this problem or maybe Allah is dealing with this problem. But at any rate, the problem is being dealt with on some level. Um, but the, the, the ultimately, the real problem of Iran is the obstacle it poses to strategically reorganizing in the region. I mentioned the uh, affinity with the Indians. It would be very important to have some sort of a strategic foundation to establish an, an Iranian, Indian, Israeli sort of condominium that helps anchor the Middle East on, and, or especially the uh, Asian Middle East on both its ends and in the center, Iran. So I see the threat of Iran right now to be more the barrier, or not more, but equally to be the barrier that it poses to moving on to, to deal with the Ottoman threat, the neo-Ottoman threat, than it is just the issue of what it threatens Israel with. But I just, uh, I think they say you hate analogies, but this, this it may help. Um, the Muslim world in this case, let's say, uh, is a sick patient and it's brought into the hospital. Uh, you, the doctor's got to do triage. You go for the worst problem first. That's Iran. It's an immediate problem. Once you take care of Iran, then you deal with the long-term serious threat to the body. And the truth is, that is what Erdogan, who is a Sunni fundamentalist, uh, in, in, which he, that's what he represents. And he speaks to a world of about 1.2 billion people. He doesn't represent them, even though he says he does. So he's very slyly trying to reinstitute, reconstitute, at least culturally and eventually politically, the Ottoman Empire. That had its tentacles. The caliphate. Yes, exactly, exactly. But that has its tentacles already in so it is what you know the, the stanzas they call them in Central Asia and also into the Uyghur areas in China. It goes as far as the Adriatic Sea, um uh Bosnia. That's what he's trying to do. And I can tell you I was in Macedonia for about a, a week or so, and um the amount of infiltration that Erdogan's people are is it's it's just huge. We need to take care of the Iranian problem first. Once Iran, and I totally buy Dave your argument of Iran, Israel, and India um, in a strategic dialogue with the big brother of the United States, because we'd all be basically on the same page. 
and then we can deal with uh, uh, in the triage again in the in level two, which is the systemic problem, and that's what Erdogan represents. Okay, referencing a possible alliance before the reconciliation with Iran. Um, given the history of tacit, unofficial Israeli-Saudi cooperation vis-a-vis -vis their common enemy of Iran, and more recent and more public indications of warming relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia, do you foresee open cooperation between Israel and KSA as a counterweight to Iran in the near future? I think I think it's it's the worst kept secret in the world right now. Although there are many bad, badly kept secrets, um, no, I, I do believe that the uh, that there is something there. Although I do, I would want to add something about the Saudi relationship. Uh, two things uh, with Israel. One is yes, it is very uh, transactional regarding the issue of Iran. The, the Saudis are, are terrified of the Iranians. They do not see Israel anywhere near the level of threat in any shape or form that Iran poses. And then even without Iran, you will see the Saudis and others uh, uh, view the Ottomans, the Turks, the same way we do. In fact, in some ways right now, they're almost as worried about the Turks. Uh, the Egyptians are more worried about the Turks than they are about the Iranians. Uh, and the Saudis and the Egyptians are very strategically close, as is the UAE. So, you know, and this is playing out in Libya. So, so I, I think that there's a number of things that will keep the Saudis continuing to function with Israel, but but uh, as, as somewhat of a cooperative alliance. That said, I, I just want to put a warning out on it, is they won't ever become Zionists, and they will never accept the legitimacy of the Jewish state for real. It, it isn't within their structure to do so. It isn't within the structure of the legitimacy of the Saudi regime to do so. However, we saw with the Treaty of Hudaybiyah when, when Muhammad was weak and he did not have the ability to deal with the threats that he faced, he signed a peace treaty. And that peace treaty was, was, was in force and real uh, as long as the Meccan aristocracy, his enemy, understood that they were powerful and acted powerfully. Uh, unfortunately for Israel, they could have a Hudaybiyah-like peace treaty with the Saudis, but they would have to understand that can be a permanent peace treaty. It doesn't have to be the 10 year time limit that the Hudabiya agreement was for Mohammed and the Meccan aristocracy. But it's dependent not on the time, it's dependent on the relationship of power between Mohammed and the Meccan aristocracy. And as a result, it's a relationship between Saudi Arabia and the power of Israel. As long as Israel plays a useful role, and it cannot play a useful role if it is not powerful. As long as Israel plays a useful role for the Saudis, there will be a, an attempt to come to terms by the Saudis with Israel. That's the foundation. The moment the Israelis think that it's something like Luxembourg with France, they're sunk. That's not the basis of these relationships. Look, um, uh, in um, Israel, from a Muslim point of view, is on exists on Muslim territory. It belongs to the Muslims forever. Anything that's ever been conquered by the Muslims belongs to the Muslims forever. You, Muslims cannot, in their gut, recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state on Muslim land. That's how the Saudis think about this. Israel, as Dave said, as long as Israel is power for everything, should be all right. But that's why it's useful. The moment that Israel is uh, it, it, it appears weak or unsure of itself, uh, Saudis are going to need other protectors, and they'll go elsewhere. Um, it, it's uh, it's the reality of the world there, and and they can make all sorts of temporary agreements. Like they've talked about Hudaybiyah, this is this agreement. It's a temporary agreement until I can be strong enough to overpower you, my, my enemy. That's the Middle East. Uh, what role, if any, could the Jews who remain in Iran uh, play in a future reconciliation? Zero. Yeah, that's my um, point. <laughs> they, they, um, right. um, let, let me answer you this way. First of all, whatever they say in public, uh, uh, they know they're, they're they're in trouble. Uh, they have supposedly a representative in 
in the Iranian parliament and he, whatever the Iranian parliament says, his goal is that people shouldn't, Jews who want to stay there shouldn't die. That's why he says what he does. Uh, the truth is that um, when Israel was reestablished in 1948, there were um, many Iranian Jews who were quite useful uh, in, in, uh, uh, in that relationship. If you ask what the Jews really think, um, in Iran, not what they say in public, an interesting story. There is a Swedish Jewish woman who runs around the world and finds Jews in an impressive country. She's a journalist and she got a visa to come to Iran. She has spent quite some, like, quite some time, about a week with the Iranian Jewish community. And there was always a minder, that is a government minder to make sure that no one said anything wrong. Now, she came to synagogue on Friday night. Now, the minder was a man, so the man couldn't go up and sit with the women. And the women there were asking her, they knew she was a foreigner, have you been to Jerusalem? Have you seen the wall? Have you seen, and, and they were almost crying. That's obviously what they really thought. There was no minder there um, where she, they, they, the women were afraid, oh my God, if they say they're gonna get in trouble. Uh, uh, there are only, Somewhere around six to eight thousand Jews left in Iran. Almost all are in Tehran. Uh, maybe a few in Shiraz in the south. But uh, the best thing they could do from their own lives. But I'm thinking as a Westerner is get out. Um, but um, you know, they their response. I'll tell you because I lived through the beginning and most stages of the Iranian Revolution, and I ran around the country after we, we whenever we, we fled from the university and trying to beg these Jews get out because I know at the time Israel was sending airplanes to just take people you know, and their response of the Jews is we've been here for 2,600 years, we, can, we, we survived, we'll figure out how to survive again here. No, I don't believe that they have any useful role. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to what Harold said. I, I'm not even sure that the role of Iranian Jews who immigrated to Israel over the last 50 years is that significant anymore, especially since, you know, you look at Israel, one could have had a conversation about this 20 years ago, but what exactly is an Iranian Jew in Israel right now? He's married, it's, he's, it, it, he's married to a, uh, he's probably 50, 60 years old, and he's married to a, a Jew from Poland or from Yemen or from Iraq, and his kids are a mixed. There's, it's they're Israeli. There's not they, they, there's there's too many halves in their in their stew. So uh, I don't even think that, that the Iranian population in Israel is a very significant factor here. Got it. Well, we're down to two minutes, so perhaps some closing uh, comments, and we'll we'll close it out. Harold, you want to go go first quickly, and then I'll I'll wrap it up. Um, Dave, you talk. Okay. Well, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the Khan class, the uh, the group of people in Iran that Ferdowsi emerged from, the Shunamid um, dynasty, which was sem and, and how this is the foundation of Persian culture. I would really urge people to to think seriously because the Iranians are thinking seriously about this period, uh, and and uh, I think the history of the Middle East shows that history in the Middle East now matters. Uh, the last hundred years and the laws, the rules, the patterns were really bizarre. They, they, they weren't quite the way history had been for a thousand years, two thousand years, even three thousand years. So I would really uh, urge people in Iran and elsewhere, uh, I, I mean, in studying Iran and studying the rest of the region is to think in terms of ancient civilizations and the reemergence of older patterns of behavior. Because we're seeing it with Christians, the old Byzantine Empire, Israel's resurrected, it is ancient Israel anew. The Persians are coming back. There is this, and the, even the Arabs are coming, are, are returning to form. And the form for them is, they, they actually sought being vassals of the great powers. Um, whether it was the Hassanids or the, the ones who were pro-Persian, the Lachmanids and so forth, these Arabs um, of a thousand years ago, they, they, they didn't have an independent superpower status. They were, they were looking how to survive in the framework of great powers. This is how I think we should, we should look at the Middle East. And in that context, 
I think we see great opportunities for the Israelis, the Iranians, the Indians, the United States to anchor the Middle East in a fundamentally different way than the way it's been anchored for the last 100 years, which has been anchored ultimately to Arab nationalism, which is dead. Harold? I agree with you 100%, Dave. We'll leave it there. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. It was a great pleasure to, to spend time with you this, this uh, afternoon. We hope you enjoyed it. And uh, again, you're welcome to go on our website to uh, see this uh, lecture again and many others. Great lectures all the time. We do this at least every week. Um, so I urge everybody to go on the Center for Security Policy website, look up these webinars, stream them. Uh, I, I think they're, they're, they're fascinating series of events. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you.